Private practitioners are at once synthesizers and dreamers. We are willing to have our ambitions, our skills, our talents, and our vulnerabilities displayed in public without being able to be there to explain ourselves. We have tremendous responsibilities. In our projects, we aim to move people, to make them happy, to make them feel safe, to add to their daily lives. With our clients, we are charged with fulfilling their ambitions and to do it on schedule and on budget. We go out into our communities to convince public agencies and citizens that our work is in their interest. We train, motivate, and invest in the next generation of practitioners, and we continue to educate ourselves, and hopefully we run profitable businesses. And we aim to do all this without harming the earth. So in the short time we have with you, we are going to respond to the current and future issues facing private practitioners. We found a number of the essays um, compelling enough to bring their words back. Um, and when we talk about the leap from education to practice, we were struck by Alpa Norway's words, today's landscape architecture students live in a complex networked world and must be prepared for a future defined by global professional practice to meaningfully engage in and to craft the built environment of not only their own community, but also of cultures dramatically different from their own, dealing with life-threatening issues related to water, food, and waste. Wow, it's tough to be a student. <laughs> so the, the question I have for our um, panel is, Students come to practice with high aspirations and expectations about the impact they can make to the world. How do practitioners fold students into firms of all sizes and types, and how will they change practice just by virtue of the way they were educated? Mark, can you talk about that? Sure, Laura. I'd like to kind of set a context for that. Um, because I remember being coming into the practice as a young kid, and I went to work for Grant Jones, who hopefully you all heard last night. And uh, uh, so the context I'd like to set is this, that as I've watched this really fantastic set of discourses that we've had in the last 18 hours or so, uh, we see an incredibly rich profession. As you said, it's tough to be a student. How do you do all these things and learn them in a few years? Uh, Grant said last night that the earth should be our client, right? I think we all remember that. And this morning, Jose said, we should be about sustaining life in all forms. Now, that got me thinking about the medical field because what do doctors do? They sustain life, that's their goal. They all know what they're trying to do, whether they're a researcher, whether they're clinical, or, or wherever they are within that very diverse field. But we don't share that sense of common purpose. So what I wanted to do is uh, remind us all of why doctors are that way. And if our academy could be that way, we can become like doctors, aligned but richly separated by our specialties. Uh, doctors think about the Hippocratic Oath, which is now 2,400 years old. And of course, most of you probably think of it as do no harm, which is part of it. But it's actually four parts. The first part is to, is to heal and sustain life at all costs. The second is to do as little as possible to harm the patient. But the third is to teach widely and profusely to spread your art, as it was called. And the fourth is to keep private those things you might encounter which are of a personal nature to your patient. So that simple set of clarities. What if our oath was to sustain life in all its forms, a healthy planet for healthy people? Something as simple as that. Then the academy could you could understand if you were doing a grading plan, 
does this improve the health of people or the earth? Does this sustain life or not? Am I doing right or am I doing wrong? Am I doing good or am I doing harm? And if we had that simple kind of ethical basis and common purpose, then we would be able to teach students and people coming into our practices, what are the consequences of your actions? Not just, not just what you draw, but what you think and how you relate to the people next to you and the engineers you're collaborating with and so on. And what is your activity going to mean to people when, it, when it's manifest in the real world? And then we need to teach and remember that design has to be accountable. Design is not all about fun and being cool and doing cool stuff. It's not. It has to be a, accountable to everything in the world or it's not sustaining life and making a happy, healthy population. What about you, Tom? <laughs> I, I want to just speak to the question uh, of how practitioners might fold some of these aspiring students into their firms and, and what it will mean to the firms themselves. Uh, really, not every, first of all, not all students are interested in private practice. Um, maybe some don't know that yet, but others do know it probably. Uh, but for those that do know uh, that they're interested in private practice, I think all, all of us would probably um, urge students and urge the programs, the academic programs, to urge students to seek internships in private offices to begin to uh, navigate that, that uh, gap between the academic world and the real world of private practice. Uh, this is all in, in preparation of how these firms might receive these students and make uh, the best use of them, if you will. Uh, I think the other, the, it, there's an inevitable gap there, and I think it's really important that the, uh, that there's a, the firms that we know have a real commitment to growth and evolution in this new world we're, we're uh, moving into. And that means that they have to be open to what these students bring to them. It's no longer about, do you know Rhino? Could I see examples of your CAD drafting? It really is about, what can you teach us? What can you share with us that you've learned from all those studios and all those lectures and all that research that you had the time to do? Uh, and so what I've suggested, uh, certainly uh, it, it's done on, I think, on a larger skirm, uh, firm scale. Joe might talk about that a little bit. But what I've suggested is that small firms actually have seminars in the office in which these students, the new entry-level landscape architects, can really conduct a seminar and teach those in that firm, elevate that firm's work and awareness of, of areas of our practice and areas of our profession and our concern that we may not be focused on on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that that's a very good way to open the doors and really welcome them. And as a result, I think that they're going to be reshaping and redefining the practice as we move forward in the future. In fact, I would, I would probably say that uh, they're going to do it in ways that we could have never imagined because it's going to be on a global and on a leadership level. What about you, Joe? Well, I think firms should be teaching institutions, and that's what we're attempting to do. Vertically integrated AECOM is, is a teaching institution. And uh, at the same time, I think the schools need professors in practice, adjunct professors in practice, very dramatically increased. And uh, so that's what I think. Now we're gonna talk about the matter of firm size. Carl Steinitz said, if we are to work on society's most important needs, both specialist knowledge and skills of collaboration in designing are essential. We must not allow the profession to become limited in the scale and scope of its competencies. I think the same can be said about firm size. So the question is to you all, large multidisciplinary firms are joining forces, AECOM combined with URS in 2014. Sorry to pick on you, Joe. And also, um, they seek to buy out smaller firms all over the world, yet many firms have less than 20, less than 10 people. So how do smaller firms make an impact? How do they be per persuasive and make a difference? Joe, could you talk to that? 
Well, I think what we're going to need here to correct the problems we've created is an army of experts. And that can come through any way you want. And large firms, such as AECOM, can have silos of civil engineers and landscape architects and, and uh, architects and others, uh, you know, scientists, etc. cetera. But uh, I'm worried about isolation. And it can happen in, it can happen regardless of size. It can happen because you, you don't, you don't cross over. You have to reach out. You have to, you have to uh, communicate with everything going on in your community. Uh, you have to, you have to uh, exercise curiosity and be, be expert driven. Smart people seek out smart people. And so you don't ever satis be satisfied with, uh, with uh, medio mediocrity. Tom? Sure. I think uh, th the reality is in our profession, um, most of our landscape architects are working in the private practice, are working in small firms, firms that are, might be under 20 or even 15 people. So I think your question uh, can also go to them. And what, 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 can, what words of advice can we offer them? Well, I think the key word is, and it's going back to what Joe said, it's collaboration. Uh, to, to get this feeling that you're making a difference and making an impact, uh, maybe some of us are believing, the, the smaller firms believe that we actually have to be in the big game, dealing with the big problems and the big issues. Uh, but you don't have to really feel like you're out of it. You can collaborate. Collaboration is a good thing. But as Joe said, you have to prepare yourself to collaborate. You have to, you have to in fact, uh, walk into that room with a knowledge that no one else in the room has and as a leader. And that, that requires an awful lot of preparation, an awful lot of dedication to the, to the seeking out and the, the inhaling of all of that knowledge. The other uh, advice I would offer uh, the smaller practices is that you might do what our studio has done. We're a relatively small studio, but we've actually done very large work and we do it with collaboration. Collaboration not just with the team that we put together of architects and engineers, but collaboration with another landscape architectural firm. There's the math we use at our job interviews that one plus one equals three. That's what the client and the project is getting. They're getting three of us. These two firms, complementary, hopefully, are actually getting together and, able, and they're able to take on much larger projects with much more complex issues. And one leads to another, and so you're always reaching. And this is the advice I would give the smaller firms. Leadership through collaboration. Back to Carl, he said a lot. <laughs> Carl Steinitz said, we must know something that other professions do not. We must be rooted in the landscape itself and at all sizes and scales in climate, geology, hydrology, ecology, vegetation, history, perception, etc. We must understand that almost everyone we do, everything we do requires collaboration with other professions and with decision makers. So the question is, how do landscape architects bring their full force of our talents and environmental credentials to the table and capture a leadership role within a multidisciplinary uh, team, even, though, even when we're not leading those teams? Catherine, could you speak to that? Sure. I think the key in that sentence is capture leadership role. And for, I can only speak to the way I, I do it, and I think that for young people, when you walk into a team, you have to know exactly who all your experts are. You have to know and want to demand from them what you need from them to make this project work. So it's not you sitting back and waiting. You have to be proactive. You have to sit there and say, okay, Sybil, how are you gonna get this water done? How are you gonna do this? So you take that leadership role. 
And I think it's something that we have to have confidence in the multi-talents we bring to the table, that we are the glue. We are the thing that pulls everything together. So you, you need to take that leadership role. The other thing is you have to do your homework before you walk into any meeting, never wait. And you have to have your goals set up and know you've got to be the smart person in that room. So everybody's listening to you. And that way, the landscape will lead. Um, I think it's really a proactive role. And Mark? Well, I've known Carl for 45 years, and so it's too bad he's not here while I make fun of him. Um, <laughs> because yesterday was the first time I was ever hypnotized by Carl as his hand went up and down, <laughs> up and down. I was feeling very sleepy, Carl. <laughs> But he made a good point, and the point that he didn't really address, he talked about bringing the scales together and so on, but it's leadership that allows you to bring those scales together. If you can't exercise leadership, your hand stays down here and you'll never get hypnotized. Yeah. And if you really want to get hypnotized fully, you've got to get up here, and leadership is how you do it. And you do that not by being a generalist. That's an easy term to use. Carl's exactly right in what he says here. We must know something other professions do not. That's absolutely right because we have to have our feet on the ground with our knowledge base that others don't fully share. We want others to know it, but they can't fully share it because we don't fully know and share theirs. But what we need to do, and we've been, I think all of us here have done this many, many times, you get on a team and you have to ask the questions. You cannot be afraid to ask the questions of the soil scientist or of the ecologist or of the politician or the elected official or the city attorney or whoever it is. You need to ask the questions to ask, to get everyone to, to, to question themselves. Are we doing the right thing? Is this policy the right policy? Is it pointed to the right outcome? Does it sustain life in all forms? You have to go to that high level and ask each of them. And as you do that, you will get beaten down. You will be challenged. Therefore, you will get better at it. You'll ask more clever questions next time. And you'll learn more about how they think as they rebut what you're doing. But take up the middle of the room, ask those questions, be persistent, and pretty soon you find that you are the person framing the situation for everyone else. So that you are the integrator, not of the activities, but of the issues and the ideas. And once you do that, you're the leader. Joe, you're in a little bit different situation in that um, you're in a multidisciplinary firm, and um, people who are in the same firm are supposed to respect each other. Ha <laughs> um, Well, yeah, I mean, and I, think, I think landscape architects are nice people, you know? They, they really are nice people. And, so and they how do you make your place in your multidisciplinary firm well, as landscape architects? I mean, you respect people. You respect their disciplines, and you, you listen. You listen, and uh, you know the Wharton School has these management roles where they, where they, you know, you you act out collaboration, and uh, and that 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 would be a good thing. It's it's not so much leading as as listening, listening by leading, leading by listening, and uh, and that that is the answer. Let's move on to resiliency and projects. Mark Tribe said something that was kind of got a lot of nods from us, and for some of us, a little blood boiling. We'll see if that comes out. So Mark Tribe said, without aspirations beyond achieving sustainability, the work of the landscape architect becomes only a form of environmental plumbing. Catherine, do you want to talk to this first slide? Um, I think when we started talking about this, I, and somebody said, Catherine, why don't you talk about resiliency? And I said to Joe, Joe, I mean, why would they ask me to talk about resiliency? And, and you said, you know, it's, it's much broader than what you're, you're defining it. And I, I think that for a landscape to actually last, it's not just ecologically last, it has to last in the hearts and minds of people. 
and it has to touch those people. And so these two quotes about beauty, um, and beauty is different from aesthetics. Aesthetics is a style, um, but beauty has a soul, and it's something that it, it connects with you emotionally, and you can see the wonderful writing by David Brooks, and it, it elevates what um, Joe was talking about into this bigger level of um, arousing your senses and your thought and spirits. Uh, McDonough's book, if you don't, haven't read it, called The Invisible Fence, um, it makes you feel alive, and it, it meets certain needs. And I think when those needs of beauty and in, um, walking to an environment, you actually take care of something and you, you become a steward of it. We all know we take care of the people we love. And I think we will take care of you know, the, the landscapes we love. And I think part of what is really interesting is I picked out these three images, and I call it the human spirit. We all have this very primitive thing that we, we need food, we need love, we need, we need fruit. But how we interpret that culturally is constantly changing, whether you know, from the traditional Dutch to Cezanne to the modern installationists. And again, that's why aesthetics can be contemporary because they change with the culture. But the beauty is part of the human spirit and its ability to design soul into things and design that longing and desire into things. And so I think part of resiliency in when you're designing into the teams is make sure you're getting that human spirit in there. And that human spirit could have just walked out of school. Um, it's, it has no age, it has no race, it has no, um, it's not male or female, it, it's really the soul. And uh, sometimes we get so bogged down, we forget to listen to what is actually going to make our life richer. I think that Keith has... Yeah, Keith. <laughs> you notice they saved the best for last here. <laughs> um, you know, actually, in thinking about resiliency, it's, we could go into a scientific definition of what resiliency is, but in the context of resiliency in both the projects that we work on and the practices that we lead, I have a couple thoughts on that. One is that, you know, we always see the Venn diagram of, of ecology or environment and society or culture and economy, and somehow we're supposed to work in the middle of those three overlapping spheres. And um, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> I, I think that, that we need to be looking at a way where you know, a vibrant and robust economy is totally dependent, I think, on a healthy, um, just, equitable, and fair society. So if you don't have that, you don't have a, a vibrant and robust economy. And I would argue that in order to have a just and equitable and fair society, you need a healthy, intact, and interconnected ecosystems. So if we aren't starting with that as our foundation and building up, then I don't think resiliency is really going to work. And I, I think that's true in the way we also operate our companies and our f practices and our firms and everything from how we treat people to um, the types of work we go after to the types of relationships that we build. Um, they need to be sort of nested. It all needs to be nested or it needs to be interconnected on both sort of a physical and temporal scales. And if we don't do that either, um, it's not gonna be resilient. And it needs to be systemic and whole system. So we've heard a little bit of, about that um, throughout the past couple days. But really looking at it from sort of the three tenets of resiliency that I see, one, that going back to Lisa Marie Lister's um, idea, it starts with wildness, right? Nature, we can talk about nature, but if we don't have wild nature out there, as a juxtaposition or a balance to the cities and urban areas that we have, we don't have resiliency in the long run and our cities will fail. Um, so we really need, I think, as a profession to be leading not only all the urban work that we're doing, but all this sort of rewilding, reconnecting, restoring work that's going on out there that's desperately needed in order to have those intact ecosystems that keeps us all healthy and um, uh, alive. Uh, we look at the sort of the cascades of, of removing keystone species from environments and 
they're just having devastating effects on our landscape. And if we don't take a role um, and advocate for and practice the idea that we have to return some of these keystone species like the wolf to these uh, wild areas, then again, um, we're not going to be that, that resilient. You know, E.O. Wilson, um, who uh, uh, Lisa Marie talked about yesterday, in the context of climate change, when he was asked about climate change, he responded and he said, well, really, the folly our descendants will least likely to forgive us is the loss of biological diversity in the long run. And that's what's happening now. We're going through this sixth grade extinction. And again, as a profession, as practices out there, if we're not paying attention to that, and we're not embedding those ideas into all our work, um, then um, uh, we, we, we're going to have some, some issues there. So I see the idea of moving from human rights to species rights. And there's a big movement underway. And it would be great for the LAF and the um, ASLA to take stands on that. And you know, take stands not only on human rights, which I'm not sure they have, but also on species rights. Um, I think we need to stop talking about ecologies, which I find is sort of a very confusing and somewhat deceiving term. Um, I think rather to be truly resilient, and it goes back to collaboration and some of the other things that the panelists have talked about in a multidisciplinary firm, we need to really embrace the idea of landscape ecology and conservation biology and restoration ecology and biomimicry and biophilia and all that, right? Not necessarily embedded in all of our practices, but bring it in on many of our, our, our work. And we can't forget the sort of traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom that's out there too that has to, we have to do. The second tenet is sort of borrowing from Randy Hester, you know, the whole idea of ecological democracy. I mean, we're all privileged. We are extremely privileged. We're privileged to be here right now. You know, most of us are, are from the U.S. or from a de uh, developed country. We're extremely privileged. And I think sometimes we forget that we're consuming resources at an unprecedented rate. I think right now they've estimated that we're using like two and a half times the capacity of the earth to replenish those resources. And we can build all the cities we want. Um, and the cities, you know, we're thinking the cities are the panacea, but they're still consuming resources. And if we take people in developing worlds and move them into the city and they're educated and their lifestyle, their, their, their living standards go up, then there's going to be even more of an impact on our resources out there. So we as landscape architects and in private practice have to find ways to work in those realms, I think. Um, so I think to be more resilient, you know, we really need to sort of commit to a design approach that incorporates ecological democracy and really a safe sort of and secure landscape for everyone and everything out there. And then finally, I think, you know, in terms of resiliency, we need to change the politics and the economic bureaucracies that really impede our progress toward practicing in a more systemic and a more sort of whole systems long-term perspective. And I think Kate, Kate reminded us of that yesterday, and she challenged us to that, right? That it really requires, resiliency really requires that we need to take a hard look at the political and financial systems out there and really turn them around to make sure that they really catalyze ways, sort of novel approaches about working at multiple scales, about working with multiple stakeholders, about many of the, including many of the voiceless stakeholders that we don't even really um, uh, look at, such as all the other 100 million species that are out there. They, they often don't have a voice at the table, and they need to have a voice at the table. And then finally, you know, financial capital rules. It rules on everything that we do. We all know in, in our private practices it rules that, you know, without a profit, without making money, we don't stay in business, but we, we need to find a way to bring in natural capital, cultural capital, spiritual capital into all the work that we do. Um, you know, so finally, for me, resiliency requires conviction, resiliency requires spirit, and resiliency requires humili humili humility in everything that we do. Thank you. Well, what I would say, I would add to that, Keith, you know, your firm works with our firm despite everything that we have in-house. Right. Uh, yep. You guys help out tremendously. Thanks. So hire him. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, in the last few minutes that we have, we wanted to talk about um, the reach of practice. And I have a very general question um, meant to be so for all of you, which is, what is the future responsibility of, of practice? What will change? Do well, you want I, to start, I, Mark? I do think Joe? that 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 is fundamentally true. What will change is change. Change will get faster worldwide practice and uh, and 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 this army of experts that I talk about will be needed. So you you better listen. And be adaptable. And and be adaptable. Right. Catherine. Yeah, you have to adapt all the right. time because everything's moving around you. Right. Um, I, I think in the last two days we've heard a lot about the technical aspects uh, and physical aspects of trying to align our profession with a healthier planet, and those are uh, critically important. But what I see changing that we have to be responsive to, and I think responsible to, is the world is being driven apart more quickly by cultural and political narrative than perhaps even climate change and the other big things that we face. And if we don't learn how to enter our voice into that narrative, whether it's in a political way or a cultural way or both, we're going we're gonna to lose. I, I worry about isolation, that landscape architects will isolate themselves either through the academy or through their practices, be they small and neighborhood-like, those, those lower scales that, that Carl Steinitz referred to. And, uh, and I think that's where most of the landscape architecture profession is located. And uh, yeah, we've so, got to break so out. But you know, the, the other thing is, is what was interesting about an earlier panel was this design recognition. And I think the landscape architecture, people do not know what we do. Right. And I think the problem is, is somehow we have to find a way that actually educates the public to see what we do and to see that it has taken a human hand to make it work better. And it's not just nature taking care of itself, that we are actually taking care of it. And it's so somehow, we, maybe what Ken Smith was saying is right. We have to be bolder. We have to create something that says, hey, look at this. Hey, you guys, wake up. Because if not, it's just going to slide under the blanket again. Right. But, uh, and advocacy in some way. Yeah, I, I would say that there's, uh, I think we would all agree that there's, uh, certainly in the last 50 years, and, and maybe even more so in the last 20 years or so, there's a real shift in the profession's focus. Not focus, attention. Not, it's going now much further beyond the natural systems, which we were, we were all attracted to this profession because of that first word, landscape. Uh, but the problems we're talking about, the challenges we're talking about addressing really go beyond the natural landscape. And landscape architects can, I think, do a better service and, and work at these challenges better if they have uh, as much attention to the, the the, uh, the policies, the people, the art, the, the social, the, the economic, all the issues, and, and wrap their arms around those with the same kind of uh, embrace as they would a tree. I think it's, it's time for this profession to get out of the woods and get one foot into the, the direction that this world is going in, which is an urbanization. It's irreversible. We have to help make it better. Well, I think also we need to get into the developing economies of the world because that's where the danger is. That's where we will fail as, you know, Earth is our client. But and we have to find an economic way to do this. Right. Yeah. Well, yes, it, it, we, it, we have to have clients think... and projects and programs that, that support that. And Keith. we can go out and get those. Keith's you know, statistic would suggest we should also look in our own backyard. Well, yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, the 50 years ago, it was really the declaration of concern about environmental issues. 
And now we're talking about sort of the declaration of landscape architecture and where we're going to go in the next 50 years. And I hope 50 years from now it's the declaration of success that, you know, we've, we've been able to tackle and, 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 and really work on these huge challenges that we have ahead and we're really making a difference out there. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have questions? Or? There we go. They appear. <clears throat> I'm at the distinct disadvantage of not being able to see close or far. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say I'm blind. Do you want me to read it for you? <laughs> Actually, let's answer the first one. Okay. It's a good one. Can you explain the pay discrepancy for young professionals? I needed an MLA to get my job, but my job pays enough to barely cover loan payments. Is what, there a pay discrepancy? Well, well, the discrepancy between uh, which professionals, from what I understand, landscape architects are making more money than architects. So I'm not sure the discrepancy, uh, there's a discrepancy be, between what you, you deserve and what you're getting paid. There's no doubt about that. But, but I don't know what discrepancy is, well, is, I, is being referred to. Yeah, I think part of it is a failure on our educational system yeah. to, it's you know, that, that they charge so much money oh. for education, right? So then all of a sudden, private practice or you go in and you have all this debt. So I think it's a more systemic issue than just why am I not being paid enough to cover that. I think also, you know, the whole idea of living wages and making sure that every firm and everybody out there has the ability to pay living wages and those living wages can be used to pay off debt like that, so. And I'm not sure that having an MLA actually ensures you a job. What ensures you a job right. is your spirit and your intelligence and your smartness and, and how you present yourself and how you, you come to the table. So, you know, maybe we don't need the MLA you know, at right. some point. Well, there's but a difference between somebody who's truly entry level and somebody who's been with you, say, three years. Because yeah. the way, the amount your w salary can go up in that three years is quite substantial. Yeah. If, you know, if you've proven that you are really are committed and passionate and, and are, are thirsty to make a contribution, then you're gonna be compensated for it. There's a related question here, which is, um, what do you think about unpaid or low paid internships? We'll leave it at that. There's more to the sentence, but I yeah. think that's a good one. I don't think tr there should be such a thing as an unpaid right. internship. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't totally either. agree. Yeah. Yeah. But and there should be internships. There should be internships. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And but I it's, think not, it's not indentured service. We're not into slavery. I think you should rebel <laughs> and not do that. Right. Don't take them. And don't, don't I also them. find that students come to us and say, I'll work for free. I don't want no, you to work no. for free. I really don't because there is a value to your time um, and I think it's a decent thing to do. So it doesn't necessarily give you an edge to say that you'll work for free. Um, the next question I find interesting is how does actually the firm practice and need to shift and change to meet the 21st century challenges? It's, it's a constant learning curve. I mean, we have this field that is, I mean, have you seen what's happened in the last 20 years? Our field has totally changed. I mean, and it's going to totally change again in the next 50. So how do we do our practices that are nimble and that are able to constantly be teaching ourselves and learning? So it's not just the education at the school. It's the education within the firm constantly so that we can evolve as this rapid change happens. And I think that's really the big change for a, a firm in the future is making sure that education is happening internally. And on the first part, I think I already answered it. How does it relate to a declaration? I think we need a clear and commonly held purpose 
in order to make a declaration, to make an effective declaration. Sustain life in all forms. Sustain life in all forms. I'm all over it. <laughs> so how do you make a good landscape architect a great manager? You don't. You teach them. <laughs> <laughs> you teach them. You teach them. No honesty. Someone needs to answer that question for us. Yeah. I, I think, I think that they have, we, Mark and I actually talked about this on Thursday an awful lot uh, in the round table. Uh, it really is something you learn over time and sitting next to someone like Mark or Catherine uh, in a meeting and watching the way they manage uh, to really understand what management is because it's not just project management. It's management of your own team. It's management of the complex team that you're probably working with. It's management of the client. It's management of the public sector if it's public work. Management is very, very multifaceted and it, it can really only be learned, I think, through time and experience working with a, a senior person yeah. or, or an experienced professional. Well, anyone, that, anyone that learns that their actions have to be accountable becomes a better manager. Is that and if simple? they've got some skin in the game, Mark? Skin in the game <laughs> works, yep. Is, Manage yourself. Is there yeah. any way to get ahead besides being a project manager? Suppose I'm a fantastic designer, but I don't have the project management bone. Then what? Well, you then you, 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 you track that person into design. Mm -hmm. And, that, and, uh, and as, as objectionable as that may be, tracking, but you, uh, help, them. you help them. You, you, and you teach them to, to make budgets and to make projections and, and achieve the numbers accountable. Because there's, there Here. is a limit to time in design, right? We, you know, we don't, we, I, I don't know if it, as a profession we're really, um, you know, I think when you get into management or leadership, your compensation goes up. But like you said, if you become a great designer, if you're a craftsman, craftswoman at what you do, and, and you do it really well, does your compensation go up equally? And I think as a profession, we've probably done a poor job of having those parallel tracks and really rewarding people for their craft versus management or leadership. And I think we all need to be doing a better job of that. Peter Walker once said to me, you know, a lot of people can have ideas, but the people who actually can build them are extraordinary. And so I think that having those ideas and then mentoring people to help them learn all the tools to get them built, that that is part of our leadership role. Well, I agree. Yeah. I agree completely. Uh, you know, people can work slow or they can work fast. Talent people work very fast. Mm -hmm. Extreme talents work extremely fast. They have good ideas and they're accountable to their numbers and their budgets. I find the second one here kind of interesting. Lots of talk of stewardship. How can we be stewards and make a profit? Uh, I think that's entirely, that's a matter of self-definition. You go out and define who you are in the world and if, if you want stewardship to be central to what you are trying to accomplish in the world, you have to make sure people know that, you have to articulate it very clearly and you have to get that message out so that the right people come to you, right? Yeah, I, I think you can. I think you can do that. I think you he's can proof. be a steward yeah, and proof. make a profit. And I think that, I mean, that was one of the reasons we purposely set up Biohabitats as a for-profit firm to prove in the economy that you can do good, do well, and still make a profit. So. What will practice look like in 20 years? We have no idea. Well, Sometimes I well, add that I think it's, we don't need to know. We don't we, need to know. We don't need to know. We need to adapt. Yes. Right. And, uh, and change. Be willing to change. There's probably a lot of more open platform and cross platform idea generation, uh, debate, d discourse about uh, finding the right path. But ultimately, 
the different disciplines are going to have to deliver their parts. That part won't change. And we're going to see a lot more of aid through technology, through visualization, virtual reality, um, less travel, cutting corn, you know, the communication skills that we're gaining through technology are extraordinary. And I think that's going to just allow us that interdisciplinary, that communications with people across the planet. Um, and it doesn't matter the language anymore. You have instant translation. It doesn't matter where you are anymore. And I think that's, that's going to just keep growing. The last question. I think that's yeah. a good, uh, Laura, that's a good lead into number 14. Uh-oh. Well, numbers got mixed up, I guess. Could, could I um, oh, get, no, uh, get more personal? Number 15. <laughs> what will pro oh, wait a minute. What What's the average? the average age in the panel? I'm oh, 39. my God. When they 39? started their no. private practice. <laughs> oh, when they started their private practice. They're 39 again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was 30. I was 30. I was 26. I was 27. I was 24. I never started my own practice. <laughs> Actually, I came from school to New York and started my own practice. Nobody would hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>